There's something wonderful about the way the nights draw in at this time of the year. I really look forward to brightening things up with seasonal decorations and beautiful twinkling lights. And there's no better excuse to get out of the cold and get cozy by the fire. No matter what the rest of the year has brought, this is a time for celebration. And for me, that means a menu worth celebrating. I want to share with you some of the things I love to prepare during the festive season. And maybe there's a chance they might make this year's celebrations extra special for you. Winter feasts are so often full of richness, but I like to start with something lighter, where the produce is the star of the dish. Irish beef is at its best at this time of the year, and I love beef carpaccio. So we start with our dressing, and we have here some lemon juice. We have some balsamic. So about a teaspoon of mustard. Some Irish rapeseed oil and some lovely local Irish honey as well. So the honey just balances out the balsamic and the lemon juice nicely. This can be done the day before or a week before. A little pinch of salt and just a tiny bit of pepper because we've got the mustard in there anyway. And then just give that a little whisk to emulsify. Now onto our beef. So this is about 300 grams of the most beautiful Irish beef. And all we're going to do is cut it into really thin slices. A good tip is to keep it really cool beforehand. So that's either refrigerated or you can freeze it for about 30 minutes just so that it stabilizes. It makes it much easier to cut into skinny slices. You can also ask your butcher to cut into skinny slices for you, make your life so much easier. And this is such a simple dish to make. I purposely chose rocket and watercress because I just feel the pepperiness of both of these beautiful greens works so well with the richness of the beef. So we'll just pop this in here like that. And then just a tiny bit of dressing over it. The rest can be drizzled over later or served separately. I never like to put too much dressing on anything because it weighs down the leaves. And I think a dressing should just barely coat your greenery. Just gently mix. And now we just need our serving plate. So this is a classic Italian recipe. I've dressed it up with the greens I'm using. And then you get your beautiful beef. I just simply kind of fold it a little bit down along the plate. And next I have some olives, just some green olives. Personal preference, as I say, pop them round. And I'm quite generous with the Parmesan shavings. And how about that for a very simple but elegant starter, beef carpaccio. I'm always on the hunt for the best local produce. And every now and then you come across a producer growing something you wouldn't expect. Carl is a landscaper and tree surgeon who has started the Regan Nut Farm out of his passion for growing trees and of course, eating nuts. Carl, thank you so much for having me in your orchard. This looks amazing. But tell me, when did you plant it? Uh, well, Catherine, we planted these back in 2013. There were two-year-old trees that right. got, I got from a nursery in County Mayo. There's about four or five different varieties. The reason being is because you need a couple of different varieties to cross-pollinate mm -hmm. trees. How long did it take for you to get a crop? I'd say probably within the second year. There was, you know, That's you get a, quite a small yeah. small crop and then as the years went on probably by year five six yeah. that's when we're starting to get proper yields now yeah. you know and so what kind of yield like how many trees are here there's around 700 between the two fields oh, um that's so, quite substantial yeah so generally you probably get about a kilo maybe a kilo and a half a tree is it just hazelnut cow uh no we actually we planted walnut trees as well is there a lot of maintenance on the trees like pruning and you obviously <coughs> have to keep them to a certain size so that you get yeah. a better crop the hazel is naturally a shrubby tree yeah so what you try to do is discourage this by pruning them down and then what i'll do in february now is i'll open up the, a framework you know to allow light into the tree and i'll obviously reduce the height for picking for 
next August, September. So we, we actually don't use any chemical or sprays yeah. or fungicides or insecticides on the trees. But what I try to allow is, is nature to come in, like we have ladybirds and, you know, um, earwigs that kind of eat a lot of the, the unwanted pests like aphids that attack the leaves and the trees. But um, harvesting, so a certain amount of them fall to the ground, but then they also have to be harvested from the tree. And I heard that's great crack altogether. Yeah, well, we had a good bunch of youngsters and uh, a lot of my family came over and helped. So it was good fun. Yeah. Uh, now the kids could only reach the lower ones, but but uh, yeah, it's, it's a good day out for them. And it's yeah. great for them to learn about nature and harvesting and, you know, food in its natural environment. Like well, you say, this is such an Irish product. You know, mine is lo locally sold and within a 10, 15K radius. So, really? you know, so it's, but uh, there could be a lot, of, a lot of smaller growers doing it, you know. But the whole uh, harvest is distributed within yeah, such a short yeah. space. Whereas generally That's our nuts amazing. we import from China and Turkey, you know, you're talking thousands of miles, so. Yeah, but yours are full of goodness. They haven't traveled at all and yeah. everything's a natural environment. Am I here at the right time of the year to taste any? Yeah, well, we, we're, we've we done dried already, so I can bring you in to show you, we'll crack a few. Brilliant. If that's yeah. okay. So, yeah. these haven't been toasted or roasted or anything, but how do you like your hazelnuts? Uh, I actually, I, I'm a big roasted fan, so I love putting them in the oven. Just basically on a tray for 20 minutes, turn them and they're mm. absolutely delicious. They're absolutely lovely. Yeah. They're, they're really nice. fresh tasting. Yeah. You know, they're creamier in texture as well. They would be, yeah. Well, I think uh, these would be gorgeous stuff. for some of my Christmas recipes. There's one in particular that involves Brussels sprouts, and I think the hazelnuts will be marvellous with Brilliant. them. And I might take a few walnuts too, if that's possible. Yeah, no, that's absolutely fine. Yeah. Thank you so much Not for having me in your home and on your farm. Not at really all, Really enjoyed Catherine. it. Enjoyed it. Thanks, <laughs> million. I'm doing a delicious roast duck and it's glazed with some orange and honey. It looks great, it tastes amazing. To serve with that, I'm making some stuffing balls and they are apple, walnut and chestnut, a perfect festive flavor. And then as a gravy, we're making a port and red wine sauce. Now you can see from this, we've got a portion here which would serve about four people, but there's plenty of space on this roasting tray. You could do a second one. The leftovers are fabulous the next day with a bit of hoisin sauce and pancakes. So the first thing I want to do is make little slashes here in the skin because during the roasting process, the fat will just ooze out and gather underneath here in the tray. And you can keep that beautiful duck fat. Makes great roast potatoes. Okay, nice bit of salt. Now I have some chopped thyme. This orange here is just going to ooze flavour into this and now I have a sprig of bay, pop that in and seal it up. It's now a little bit of orange zest. So a bird this size will take about an hour and 15 minutes in the oven and then you'll need a little bit of resting time, about 15 minutes to rest and then you can enjoy your beautiful orange and thyme flavour duck. The glaze on the duck gives a beautiful colour and a lovely flavour and that flavour seeps into the duck breast so it's absolutely delicious but when you take it from the oven it has a beautiful shine off it too because of the honey. I think you'll find it's a winner. Here I have some local honey, pop that into a saucepan and some orange and you can dress this up, a pinch of mustard in there would be gorgeous, some fresh herbs. I'm just going to leave this to simmer, let it cook down a little bit and then I want to get on with the chestnut and red apple stuffing. The first step in making the stuffing is to melt the butter and there's a generous portion of butter in this. Okay, so let's pop in our onion, our garlic and our celery. And I'm popping the pancetta in as well. So we're just going to sweat down the veggies and cook the meat. Now when my base mix is cooling, I can crack on with the rest of the stuffing. Every good stuffing has breadcrumbs in it, doesn't it? You can use gluten-free breadcrumbs if you wanted to. Salt, pepper, two teaspoons of sage, one teaspoon of chopped rosemary, very generous teaspoon of parsley. And here I have some chestnuts. These are already roasted and I can just crumble these in. Walnuts, apples. I'm gonna leave the skin on because it's nice for texture and it's lovely for color as well. So we now just mix this together and our other mix is just cooled so we can pop in all those gorgeous flavours. So to bind that I'm using eggs. Now if you wanted to you could just pop this in an overproof dish buttered, put a little bit of baking parchment over it 
and bake it in the oven. But I want to make little balls because I think they're gonna be nice for garnish and also for serving. People can take one or two. They go into the oven just to bake. Everything is practically cooked through. We just need to cook the egg and give them a lovely color. So about 20, 30 minutes in the oven, we'll do them grand. The port and red currant sauce has an element of tartness because of the port, but the sweetness of the red currant. And then I've given it a bit of bite with crystallized ginger in there too. Duck can take these flavors really, really well. It works with sweet and with savory. And this brings both to the table. I have some citrus, an orange, a lemon, and I just want to zest those. And I'm going to cook off the zest, and that's going to end up in the sauce. It's going to give a lovely flavor and just that bite of citrus as well. Literally a couple of minutes just to take the bitterness out of the zest. That's all it takes to cook these. And then we strain them off and get on with making the sauce. This is a very quick recipe. All we need is some port. Okay, and then in goes our red currant. And I'm just going to juice the fruit straight in. So about two teaspoons of the crystallized ginger, one teaspoon of the chopped thyme, and one teaspoon of the mustard. Now move into a whisk because I want to break down the red currant jelly. Bit of salt, bit of pepper. Then put that on a low heat and just leave it to simmer for about five minutes for the flavors to melt. Now for my veggie side, I decided to go with something very traditional, which are these beautiful baby carrots and Brussels sprouts because it's Christmas. But I want to make them really special and I have Carl's hazelnuts here, they're absolutely beautiful. I love adding flavor to vegetables and a flavor butter always works well. In this case, I'm doing butter, honey and some gorgeous toasted hazelnuts and it works so well with the Brussels sprouts and carrots. So in here, we have a nice bit of butter, get the pan on, pour in the honey, It, and now we can pour in the chopped hazelnuts. So you can pour all of that in. And you just mix this together. We're just going to generously pop out our lovely veggies with the hazelnuts all around. And then I'll dot the stuffing in around that too. Don't get me wrong, I love turkey on Christmas day, but duck is a very practical dish and it's lovely and moist as well. There's nothing wrong with having both. And here it is, our delicious orange and thyme roasted duck. The wonderful sprouts with the carrots and the fantastic hazelnut honey mix on top. And of course, our lovely stuffing balls. And let's not forget, we have here our port and red currant sauce. Make sure you stay tuned after the break. It's time for a really spectacular, easy to make dessert. My delicious white chocolate and gingerbread Yule log, a beautiful, rich and gluten-free way to finish your festive meal. For me, this time of the year is almost as much about the build-up, the anticipation. Every town you pass through seems brighter and happier, glittering with lights. At home, there's always the scent of sweet treats baking in the warm ovens. My dessert centerpiece is a white chocolate and gingerbread Yule log. Think about it, it's everything you want for Christmas. So to start with, we'll make our sponge. For that, we need eggs, caster sugar, and the treacle. Gosh, the smell of that. It's gorgeous. So this is already looking great, smelling good. It has that lovely light air that you want because we are making a very light sponge. Now I am using oat flour because I want mine to be gluten-free and this is gluten-free oat flour. So going in with a pinch of salt and I'm going to sieve in my flour. Next, a little bit of vanilla. So about three quarters of a teaspoon of powdered ginger and about the same of cinnamon and a quarter teaspoon of cloves and the same of nutmeg because both of those are fairly powerful in flavoring. And now what we do is fold in, get my spatula down underneath, lifting up the dry ingredients. So you flick it up, but you do need to mix it well while still holding on to the air in the eggs. And I can pop 
on my beautiful sponge and just spread that out and you can see all those lovely air bubbles in there it's going to give me a lovely light sponge it's worth the effort getting the mixing right at the beginning and folding gently and straight to the oven so the filling in this gingerbread u log is going to be beautiful lemon white chocolate and ginger so all those flavors that i love are all coming together so we start with a little bit of cream and we go with the icing sugar zest of lemon and I'm going to go with juice of about half the lemon as well. And now all I do is just whisk up my beautiful lemon cream mix. And now I just fold in some of my favourite ingredients. White chocolate. And I adore crystallised ginger. So you can already see the flavours are building up for the inside, let alone the sponge tasting so good. So you can see the sponge is just coming away from the edges. That means it's drying out a bit, which means it is perfect and it's ready for action. So we're not going to hang around and tip it out straight onto more parchment paper. And then you just roll it on itself like that. Let that cool and then pop it in the fridge just to let it set. So now it's time for the buttercream. I'm just going to bring the water here to a boil and then down to a low simmer. And then the white chocolate will just melt slowly. So the Swiss roll has cooled. Let us open it out. I mean, who wouldn't want this? White chocolate and ginger and lemon. That's a marriage made in heaven. So when the filling is spread as evenly as possible, just start rolling up again like this. Now I'm just going to cover it again in the fridge just to settle a little bit so the cream just firms up a wee bit and then I can decorate it. So the white chocolate is just melted. When I take it off the heat it needs to cool in order to make the buttercream. So with the icing sugar sieved now all we need to do is get the butter in and just start mashing the butter up just to soften it with the icing sugar. Okay and the white chocolate is cooled we can pop that in too. Okay, we stand back, start on the lowest speed and off we go. So I'm going to get that into a piping bag and then I can go ahead and decorate. Oh, that's perfect. You can just decorate it as it is, but to have the log, what you do is you get your knife and just cut at an angle like this. And we lift this over onto our board. and then we put our log on it. I think that's beginning to look like a log. And all I usually do now is just strips, but actually it makes it a little bit easier just to get a tidy run on it. And then after that, we can always fix it up. So we're going to use a knife or a mini palette knife just to fix it up. I believe this falls into culinary therapy category. You can just zone out. And then, but well, what you're trying to do is the bark of the log. So you get your skewer, and you just drag it down and you just start making lines. So a light dusting of cinnamon and you'll just see already a little lifting of the colour. So pop that on like that. And then finally, we're going to let it snow with a little bit of icing sugar. That is my white chocolate and gingerbread Yule log. Happy Christmas. An amazing meal requires a special drink to accompany it and here in Ireland one of the spirits that we are best known for is our whiskey. On my doorstep in the Garden of Ireland is one of my favourites, the Powers Court Distillery. Hey Jerry, how are you? I'm very good Catherine. You're very welcome here to Powers Court Distillery. Oh thanks so much, it's an absolutely gorgeous location isn't it? Well I think we're privileged here to be in North Wicklow. Probably one of the most beautiful uh, counties in Ireland. Back in 2014, I had a bit of a moment of madness and prepare a business plan to build a distillery here on Paris Court Estate. And you need three ingredients to make good whiskey. Uh, good barley, which we produce here in Paris Court Estate, good water, but also a master distiller. And we have probably one of the best master distillers in the country, um, Noel Sweeney. He was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2017. He's number 41, and he's produced some fantastic whiskies out there like Connemara, Kilbegan, Green Ore, Tyr Connell. And to have him here in Paris Court, 
producing our whiskey is really, it's special. It's, gil it's the gilding, isn't it? It's the, it's the gilding yeah. on the edge. Mm -hmm. We're doing some really interesting things with Wicklow produced food, with Wicklow naturally, and we have a local food historian here, Santina, and she has paired up some beautiful foods with our whiskies from Noel. Hi, Santina. Hi, Catherine. You're very welcome. Thank you so Lovely much. Lovely to see you. I have a couple of our whiskies laid out here, and we do a food and whiskey pairing tour here at Paris Gourd. This one here, what, what's this? This is one of my favourites, I have to say. So it's a 10-year-old single grain, so it's actually made with corn, so there's a natural sweetness coming out mm. in there. So we've chosen this beautiful Wicklow farmhouse cheese. It's from Arklow mm -hmm. in South County Wicklow. So a lovely coastal farm. So there's lovely sea breezes washing in over the grass, giving that great flavour to the grass and then great flavour to beautiful Irish milk. We've also added in some of our local honey. So the honey is actually from right beside us here at the distillery. So oh, that's beautiful. Really, and people are really surprised when they come through the tour, they're really surprised with how honey and cheese, of course, not typically eaten in Ireland, even though mm. it would have been years ago, but how well they all work together. Well, so. honey and cheese, I think, is always a marriage made in heaven. But the warmth in your mouth from the whiskey, mm -hmm. that's like burning. Yeah, I know, Feeling absolutely. It works yeah. incredibly well yeah. then. This almost like this just tones everything down. Yeah. It's beautiful together. And, no, absolutely. That, that whiskey yeah. is really really searching for something creamy to cling yeah. to in your mouth, yeah. yeah. We're quite unique in terms of what we have here. You can see a full production process on one floor. The barley comes into these oh, grain yeah. silos here at the back. It gets mashed in the mash tun there for a yes. few hours. And it's piped over here? It's piped over here to our magnificent stills here. Wow, yeah, they're just, I mean, they're so eye-catching. They really are kind of a work of art. An Irish whiskey still their whiskey three times and that really takes out all their heavy metals and the impurities and it gives you a whiskey which is very clear a really high quality and um, probably is the best in the world i think personally we have to develop a certain appreciation for what we have on our doorstep which is irish whiskey we're in the golden era for irish whiskey now where we're seeing the come back to where it was back in the 18th century when irish whiskey was really the dominant whiskey across the world yeah. So I suppose like putting some of the fur colour now in an Irish coffee would be a no-no, would it? <laughs> well, it's as, as Noel <laughs> says, he doesn't mind uh, how you drink it, just as long as you're drinking his whiskey and plenty of it. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> <laughs> Having tasted the 10-year-old fir colon, I just knew that would lend itself beautifully to a delicious, elegant cocktail. I want to make a Manhattan, but no ordinary Manhattan. I'm doing an Irish Manhattan, an American classic with an Irish twist. One part fir colon Irish whiskey, one part sweet red vermouth. Instead of a maraschino cherry as a garnish, homemade cherry syrup, a dash of marmalade bitters, chill with ice, stir, strain and serve. For the mocktail, one part orange juice, one part cranberry juice, homemade cherry syrup, a few drops of marmalade bitters. Garnish with cranberry and orange ice cubes and a twist of orange zest. Happy Christmas. White chocolate and gingerbread yule log. Roast duck with apple, walnut and chestnut stuffing. Beef carpaccio with mustard balsamic dressing. A classic Manhattan cocktail. A spectacular way to celebrate the festive season. I hope the special menu brings you inspiration when you're planning your celebration. Happy Christmas. Isn't that right? Happy Christmas. <laughs>